Well, last week we finished up 1 John, uh, the book of 1 John. We looked at chapter 5, and this week we're going to go to uh, 2 John, uh, the next book. 2 John, it's a very short book. 2 John and 3 John are very short letters that John wrote. Uh, most people believe that 2 John was written before 1 John. They're not in chronological order in our Bibles. They're in the order of length. 1 John, of course, is five chapters long. And then in Greek, 2 John is 32 lines long, and 3 John is 31 lines long. And so that's how they line them up, the length of the books. But 2 John and possibly 3 John were written before 1 John about the same sorts of issues, but not in such detail. John just gets word that these things are coming up, and so he dashes off a quick letter. And then later on, when he gets more information and hears more about what's going on, and as the situation develops and it gets worse and it begins to spread, that's when he writes 1 John. So we're going to see some of the same things in 2 John that we saw in 1 John, just in a sort of condensed form. And then we're going to see different things. We're going to see a different perspective on the same problem. Let's go ahead and read the book, 2 John, beginning in verse 1. From the elder to an elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not I alone, but all, also all those who know the truth, because of the truth that resides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace be, will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in whom, pardon me, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly because I have found some of your children living according to the truth, just as the Father commanded us. But now I ask you, lady, not as if I were writing a new commandment to you, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. Now this is love, that we walk according to His commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, thus you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world people who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This person is a deceiver and an antichrist. Watch out so that you do not lose the things we have worked for, but receive a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not remain in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who remains in this teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him any greeting, because the person who gives him a greeting shares in his evil deeds. Though I have many other things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come visit you and speak face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. Father, as we consider this passage, as we look at this letter, and we examine the concerns that John had for this church. May we recognize uh, the dangers, and Father, may we avoid them. May we hold fast to the truth so that we may receive a full reward. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So John writes this letter, and he writes it to an elect lady. And there's been a lot of uh, discussion about, is this a specific woman? Maybe it's Lydia, you know, in Ephesus or, or uh, in Philippi. Uh, maybe it's uh, another woman in Asia Minor that he's written this letter to who's, who has a house meeting in her church. Or, uh, or uh, some people believe that he's, he's addressing the church as lady, the elect lady. And I believe that he's addressing the church. And the reason that I believe that is because of the word that he uses here. This word lady is only used in this book in the whole New Testament. It's not used anywhere else in the New Testament in its feminine form that it's used here. The word here is curia. And it's the feminine form of a word that is used over and over and over throughout the New Testament that we all know, curios, Lord. Every time we see the Lord Jesus Christ, it's curios. But here he uses curia, the feminine form. He's not just saying ma'am. He's addressing this lady as, a, uh, as the lady of a lord, as a royal lady. 
And we, I, I believe that he is expressing or is, he is emphasizing the church's relationship to Christ as the bride of Christ. Just as you would address the wife of a Lord as lady, he addresses the wife of our Lord, the bride of our Lord, as lady. He calls her the elect lady. He reminds us that the church has a royal stature. The church has a royal position. The church has royal authority in the universe. We share the, uh, the authority of Christ. And we have an authority to defend the truth of our Lord. We have a, we have a responsibility to defend the truth and the, uh, the rightness of our Lord. So here the elder is writing to the church, the elect lady and her children. He's talking about the members, the people of the church. He calls himself the elder because he was. You know, this is, uh, he's not just meaning church elder, someone with authority in the church. He's saying the old man. He's in his 90s. He's the last living apostle. So he is the old man of the church. And he uses that title. Uh, to write to the church here. He says he loves this church and the truth, and everyone who knows the truth loves the church. If you don't love the church, then you don't love the truth. The church is the pillar and ground of truth. The church is uh, the institution that God has established to hold forth the truth, to hold on to the truth, to teach the truth, to proclaim the truth, to be the, uh, as I said, the pillar and ground of truth. And so not only did John love the church in truth, but everyone who knows the truth loves the church because of the truth that resides in us and will be with us forever. Because the truth is in us, in this body, in this church. And as long as we are a church, we are only a church to the extent that we hold the truth. And we're not saying you love a specific church, uh, but you love the institution of the church. Those who love the truth love the church that God has established to be the bastion of truth. The truth resides in the church, and it will always reside in the church. That is the church's purpose. When the church no longer holds the truth, it is no longer a church. It's just an organization. If the church does not hold to the Word of God, it is not a church because the church was established to be truth in this world. He says, Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ. This is a standard epistolary greeting that, he, that the apostles would send to those they were writing to. Grace, mercy, and peace that proceed from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. Once again, John is emphasizing the deity of Christ. Jesus Christ isn't just a human who took on the Christ spirit, but he is God the Son. He is a member of the Trinity. He is the Son of the Father. And this grace, mercy, and peace will be with us in truth and in love. You know, there's an idea that if we just set aside doctrine, if we just don't worry about truth, then we can love one another uh, more fully. But the fact is that if we're not uh, uh, helping one another to come to the truth, if we're not uh, presenting the truth, we're not loving people. You know, I talked about... Uh, uh, you know, your children get into dangerous situations. You want to tell them, that's dangerous, don't do that. Why? Because you love them. Would you love your children if you let them uh, do dangerous things without warning them about it? No, that's not love. Love is found in truth. Now, there, is, there are people who proclaim truth in an unloving and ungracious way, and they are not being truthful because God is love. And if you're trying to teach about a loving God in an unloving way, then you're lying about who He is. You're lying about His nature through your behavior. 
So to teach truth, you must teach it lovingly. But to love, you must teach truth. They must both be there. Grace is only found in truth. If someone never hears of the grace of God, if you never tell someone of the grace of God because you're afraid you'll offend them by telling them that they need it, then you're not loving them because you know what they're facing. You know the eternity of, apart from God, the eternity in hell that they're facing, and you allow them to go there because you're afraid of offending them. Grace is found in recognizing our need for Christ and receiving His unmerited favor, receiving the gift of salvation for, for which there's nothing that we can do to earn it. It's entirely grace, but that grace is only found in truth and mercy. And peace is found in truth. We get along around the Word of God. This is what brings us together. This is what gives us peace with each other. This is what gives us peace with God. And this is what gives us peace in a tumultuous world. When we don't know what tomorrow is going to be like, boy, 2020 has been uh, uh, just a tumultuous year, hasn't it? You never know what tomorrow is going to bring. We don't know, but we know that because we have the truth of who God is and who we are in Christ, we have the truth of what the future holds and, uh, for the Christian, and we have the truth that God will give us the strength to get through whatever it is He brings us to, then we can have peace. Grace, mercy, and peace are with us in truth and love. We have grace, mercy, and peace to the extent that we have truth, and we have love. He says, I rejoice greatly because I have found some of your children living according to the truth, just as the Father commanded us. He said, I'm really happy to see that you have some members of your church that are living in the truth, where they're doing what God commanded us to do. But he's setting this up. There are some that do well, and there are some that aren't doing so well. And so, as any good uh, uh, counselor does, he, he compliments the church at first. He talks about the good things. He, he gives praise, and then he gives correction. And that's a good lesson for us. So many times as parents, or, or as uh, older people, or as leaders, or as teachers, we want to uh, immediately pounce on the correction. But the biblical principle is, we see it time and time and time again, you give praise and then you give correction. Uh, Jesus does this in the book of Revelation in the, second, in the seven letters to the churches. He praises the church and then he corrects the problems. John does this here. He says, I'm rejoicing greatly because I found some of your children living according to the truth, just as the Father commands us. But now I ask you, lady, not as if I were writing a new commandment to you, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. He said, some of your children are living in the truth, but you got to start loving each other. Now, how are they not loving each other? What is John addressing here? I believe, I mean, it's very general here, he doesn't say so, but given the context of this short letter, I believe they were not loving each other because they were not correcting one another doctrinally. They were allowing people to teach false doctrine and saying, well, that's okay. As long as you love Jesus, you're fine. John says, no, no, no. You must love one another enough to tell the truth. What is love? That we walk according to His commandments, that we follow the Word of God. This is the commandment that you, just as you have heard from the beginning, thus shall you walk in it, because many deceivers have gone out into the world. In the early church, after the apostles began to die off. Now, as long as the apostles were there, you had these itinerant <laughs> preachers going from church to church, but the apostles would squish it. They would, they would quash it. We see that in the book of Galatians, don't we? Uh, the Judaizers came, and Paul took care of it. You had false teachers going around, but the apostles were there to take care of it. But as the apostles started dying off, more and more and more of these uh, itinerant preachers would go from church to church and they would claim to be prophets. They were speaking for God and they'd show up in church and they'd say, I'm a prophet of God and God has sent me with a message. And of course the church would say, oh great, we want to hear the message from God. What's the message from God? 
And he said, gets up and says, Thus says the Lord, you shall make a steak dinner and serve it to this servant of God. This got to be so bad that uh, one of the church fathers had to send out a letter and says, if a prophet comes to you and tells you that this, he literally said, if a prophet comes to you and tells you that God has commanded you to fix a meal, if he eats from that meal, he's not a prophet of God. <laughs> if God, if a prophet comes to you and tells you that God has commanded you to take an offering and he takes the offering, he's not a prophet of God. This was so bad that a church father had to write and say, look, if they, if they take from you, they're not prophets of God. So these people were going around and they were teaching false doctrine and they were, they were profiting from the gospel. They were hucksters, the Bible calls them. And uh, they, they've come to this church. Deceivers have gone out in the world. And it's fascinating to see what it was that they were teaching. Now you remember in 1 John, they were teaching that Christ never came in the flesh that in his first coming, it was a spiritual coming, right? That he was just a spirit person who looked like he had a body, but when he walked on the sand, he didn't leave footprints and, and that sort of thing. Well, it didn't start there. The error started in verse 7, for many deceivers have gone out into the world, people who do not confess Jesus as coming in the flesh. They were denying the second coming. They were saying that Christ's coming is a spiritual coming, that the world is just going to get better and better and better until everybody has the Christ spirit in them and we're all living the way Christ would have us and he's reigning in heaven over a, over a uh, perfect earth that has just achieved utopia. But he's not really going to come back in judgment. He's not really going to come back and uh, separate the believers from the unbelievers. He's not really going to come back and judge the wicked. He's not really going to come back and do all the things the Scripture tells us. There's not, not going to be a day of the Lord. We're just going to get better and better and better. And eventually, if you don't believe in the second coming, then there's no need for the first coming. And they, they went from believing that Jesus isn't going to return to, well, maybe he never came in the first place. Maybe what we didn't need was uh, redemption or atonement or propitiation. Maybe what, it was needed, what we needed was special knowledge and revelation of uh, the God principle. And Jesus was a great example uh, of how we can uh, uh, not worry about the physical body and just live spiritual lives. You know, I'm, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. And we're going to uh, neglect the body and we're just going to be spiritual people. And we didn't really need redemption. If Christ is not going to return in judgment, then there was no need for him to come in atonement. And so the error begins with denying the second coming and it ends with denying salvation. And you know what? We have seen this in the last 200 years in mainline denominations. Mainline denominations did not start out denying the deity of Christ. They started out denying the second coming of Christ. They started out being amillennial. Oh, the world's just going to get better, and Christ is going to reign from heaven, and we, you know. And it went from that to, well, we have to twist the scriptures to get this out, so maybe the scriptures aren't inerrant, and and maybe uh, everything they say isn't true, and then suddenly uh, they're saying that Christ didn't actually rise from the dead, that it was a metaphorical resurrection to show us a new way of life. And suddenly you have no salvation at all in these churches. And that's heartbreaking because these churches, uh, you know, they, they uh, produced some of the greatest theologians uh, the world's had. 200 years ago, 100 years ago, and today they don't even believe in Jesus. Where did it start? It started with a denial that Christ is coming in the flesh. Jesus told us that he is coming to receive us unto himself. Jesus has told us that he is coming to uh, execute judgment on the ungodly. The Bible, the scripture over and over and over expresses the second 
coming of Christ, that Christ will physically return to the earth, that he will judge the wicked, that he will reward the uh, redeemed, and that he will reign on the earth. This is a constant theme from the book of Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. It is found in every book. And we cannot deny it. To deny it is to risk losing the deity of Christ. It says this person is a deceiver and the antichrist. Remember we talked about that word antichrist. It doesn't mean they're against Christ. It means they just want to replace him with another Christ. A Christ who doesn't have to come back. A Christ who didn't have to die. A Christ who doesn't have to have a body. We recognize that is not the Christ that we worship. Watch out, verse 8, so that you do not lose the things we have worked for, but receive a full reward. The joy of the second coming of Christ is knowing not that he's going to judge the wicked, although there are some wicked that everyone will rejoice to see judged, but our hearts break for our unsaved, our rebellious loved ones. We don't want to see anyone come under the judgment of God, but we rejoice in the fact that God is going to reward those who serve Him. That God is going to uh, uh, reward us for what He has done in our lives. We recognize that there's nothing I can do to please God in myself. Everything that is done without faith is sin, the book of Romans tells us. But that he is working in my life, he is producing his grace in my life, and then he's going to reward me for that. And if I don't live as though he is returning, my urgency, you know, if uh, when I was a boy, if my parents left us at home and said, I want these chores done and we'll be back at uh, 3 o'clock, well, about 2.30, we got really busy. And by 3 o'clock, everything was done. But if they didn't tell us when they were coming back, uh, sometimes they would surprise us and things wouldn't be done because we weren't expecting them. Now, we don't know when Christ is coming back, but we know he's coming back quickly. We know he's coming back soon. That's on his timetable, not on ours. And he's given us, he said, occupy, stay busy until I come. Stay busy how? By loving one another, by caring for each other, by serving God, by serving others. And if we don't believe he's coming back, then perhaps we won't be as busy and we won't receive a full reward. Verse 9 is fascinating to me. Everyone who transgresses and does not remain in the teaching of Christ does not have God. That word transgress means to go beyond the boundaries. To, uh, my translation I'm reading today says, Everyone who goes on ahead and does not remain in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Anyone who takes the Scripture and says, This is not enough. Anyone who takes the Scripture and says, I know more. There's further knowledge. I've got this revelation. God told me this. There's this other book. Anyone who goes beyond the truth the teaching, the uh, doctrine that Christ has given us in this book does not have God. So anyone who wants to give you an additional book or testament or revelation, they, it says very clearly here, anyone who goes on ahead and does not remain in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who remains in this teaching has both the Father and the Son. He is equating the Father with the Son again. He's making them equal. Once again, he's Trinitarian in his presentation. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him any greeting because the person who gives him a greeting shares in his evil deeds. We don't want to be associated with those who teach error. It's not that we're hateful or that we... Uh, uh, are rude. It's just that we don't allow our names to be associated with people who are teaching error because we don't want to lend our credibility to their false teaching and thereby allow them to drag people away who wouldn't have listened to them had we not. Now, you know how the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints 
really got a foothold in Methodist churches. Their original missionaries would go out into these country villages and they would go and they would meet with the pastors of the little Methodist churches that were out in these uh, frontier towns. And they'd help them in their chores and they'd work alongside them and they'd have Bible studies at night and they'd get the pastor to let them speak at their church and sell their books. And most of their first members came out of Methodist churches. Churches that were teaching the scripture but allowed their credibility to be used by these people who deny the deity of Christ. And we can't do that. We want to be friendly and we want to be kind and we want to be loving to everyone, but we never allow the, the, the uh, credibility of God's church to be used by those who are teaching error. So it's not saying be rude to them, it's saying guard your reputation. Guard the truth. And then of course he says, though I have many other things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come and visit you and speak face to face so that our joy may be complete. And boy, I know how, I have known how he felt over the past several months when we were unable to meet. I was making videos and I was writing emails, but I wanted to see you guys face to face. <laughs> And it is a joy for us to be able to meet face to face. So our joy is complete. And then he says, the members of the church that he is at currently, the children of your elect sister, greet you. So he sends a greeting from the other church. Today we recognize that Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh. That he is not only the Son of God, but he is God the Son. But because He is God the Son, because He has come in the flesh, He is coming in the flesh. It is not a spiritual coming, it is a physical coming. He will set His feet on the earth. He will execute judgment against the ungodly. He will establish His kingdom and the church will reign with Him. See how the use of that word curia fits in with the theme of the, the book? The church will reign with him. Let's live as though he's coming today. Father, we thank you so much for the promise of his coming. Lord, keep us in the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.